Well, the first order of business is these papers. And I, I was pleased with these papers. I saw, a good deal of, uh, I saw a good deal of work go into them. And I saw, um, in general, a high level of achievement with your writing. Uh, I want to turn these back to you. I want to explain what you're getting. You're getting the hard copy itself with penciled in comments that are more or less editorial in nature. And then you're getting um, attached to each of them a, um, you know, a, a sheet that is in effect a, a, a grade sheet, but that also has uh, my comments on it uh, about you know, th things that could be, things that were strong, but also weak points that I saw. Um, let's see, Cameron was not here. Brian, however, is here. Voila, monsieur. There you go. Uh, Eric is yeah. here. There you go. <laughs> You're welcome. Dylan is here. Dune is here. Here you go. Hi there. Hi. How are you, Vienna? Uh, let's see. Andrea is right here. There we go. Um, Danielle, for you. There you go. And Fallon, I have you right here. Let's see, Cassidy has not yet come in. Austin, here we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Joe, here we go. Uh, do I have what? Oh, I don't worry. I can. Oh, I'll, sure? I'll track okay. down a paper clip or something like that. Um, get that there. See, Allison, I think, has not come in. Lindsay, however, is right here. And here you go, Lindsay. And uh, let's see, Victor said he could not make it. Amy said she could not make it. Uh, Caitlin is right here. Oh, wait, are you coming in tomorrow? To, uh, to school? No, for, um, oh my God. What's tomorrow? For the global World yeah. War II global history. Yeah, I give a guest, a guest lecture in that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll Sorry, see you there. Been clear, but I'll see you there. Well, I'll try not to, I'll try not to stumble about as I usually do tomorrow, and give a, give some ideas from this German history that I'm supposed to be talking about. Hi there, Cassidy. A paper for you, and this this has the comments with the editorial type remarks with it. You're welcome. So I, I let's see. I have. Cameron and Allison and Victor and Amy. And just to do some bookkeeping here, we've had Rihanna has come in, as has Cassidy. Good papers, I thought. Good papers, I thought. This is, of course, the first paper uh, for this course, and uh, I, th I think there's th there's an advantage at this point to see uh, to see this process as one in which you get to know me and I get to know you in regard to these writing assignments. I think you will see that I, I put a certain premium on um, clarity of argument, which for me uh, overlaps considerably with the idea of clarity of organization. And so I look, I look with great care at not only the thesis statement that usually comes at the foot of an introduction, uh, but also at each topic sentence in the body of the paper. Uh, I also look to see whether a, um, whether a conclusion goes far enough toward the restatement of the perspective that you have offered on some particular, uh, some particular issue. And I thought there, I thought what you did was, in every case, good. I thought in some cases uh, it could have been improved, but uh, that's, what, that's what I think the university is about. I think it's about improvement. Th with regard to the uh, role of referee that each of you played, I thought each of you did um, a, a, at least a pretty good job at that, at least a pretty good job, and I saw um, I mean, you're not, you're not trained uh, composition experts, but I thought that you 
uh, were able to put your finger on some important points in the paper that you read and help the person along for whom you were the referee. And that was the sense of, um, of that assignment. That was good. Now, those of you who went about then the revision of the paper on the basis of what the referee had turned in, um, I, I would underline for you that the, that the fact that you have a referee does not turn this into somehow joint authorship uh, of the paper uh, and that really all you need to do is um, if, if they've made five suggestions and you act on three of them, which maybe took you a, a minute and a half to, to complete, that that's, uh, that's a full and sufficient revision of the paper. No, you need to revise the paper um, not only in response to what the referee has said, but also according to your own lights. In other words, the way that you think, on second glance, this paper could, could be improved. I mean, right now, for example, um, and this is very typical for scholarly writing, I have a paper that a journal has said, uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but uh, we want a resubmission. And the editor who went through it outlined some points that he or she wanted in the way of resubmission. Well, uh, on the one hand, I thought some of those points were valid, some not. And so I'm attempting to comply with the request, at least in part. Although, although it needs to be said. I mean, the fact that you have a referee does not mean that you have to respond to that referee's comments in some slavish manner <laughs> and uh, carry out everything exactly the way the referee has, uh, has put it. On the other hand, I think you can assume that there's goodwill on the part of the referee and that if they've put their finger on what they thought was a problem, uh, it may well be a problem, and they may mark out a solution that does not appeal to you 100%, but you can at least consider how to go uh, when you do your revision. But remember that primarily the revision is yours. Primarily the revision is not um, your referee's responsibility. Primarily it is yours. And as this semester goes along, we shift now from the referee to the writing fellow, and here she is in the flesh. Uh, you, uh, she will be a, uh, uh, a factor for us. And she has been a factor for us already, but she will be a factor for us um, the rest of the way out. Uh, this time, for example, with the paper, and you'll get a prompt later in the hour. The prompt is already on Blackboard. But this time, the initial copy, the rough draft, the initial draft goes to both her and to me, right? So two copies of that when the paper comes due, which it's, well, it's on the syllabus. I think it's two weeks from today. Is that, that sounds right. So, um, you know, again, the, sa the, the same issue obtains. Um, we, we've not, um, you, your relationship to us in this next assignment is not the relationship of a, Serve to a lord. <laughs> we'll, we'll make uh, we'll make our suggestions, uh, and, and, and you know we, we'll make them in good faith. And you know how you act upon those suggestions is of course up to you. And um, also, when you go through the second time, I, I'm, for example, this piece that I'm writing right now, I'm responding to what this um, editor wanted. Maybe you know half of the suggestions I'm acting on, you know in you know pretty seriously, but most of the changes I am making, I am making because on, on working through a paper a second time after a, after a lapse of some months, the paper looks different to me and what I want to do with it uh, feels very different. And so it, it, it's my revision. It's my revision, not his or hers. Go through your writing when you, when you, you know, well, I'll say a couple things here. First of all, um, I get a lot of papers that strike me as being one editorial go-round away from being ready to turn in. And I have a feeling that most of the little pencil marks I made on the hard copy of your paper um, cover points that you would have seen if you'd given it one more look. I have a strong feeling. Pardon? <laughs> Yeah, or come to, yeah, right, right. Here you go. And you're, when are, is your regular time? And, and I yeah, go every Monday from 3 to 4, and at the coffee shop outside the library. Okay. But I can meet you guys on different time periods. Okay. I can, you know, get you a group of your friends and they can come and stay with you. 
See? So, so you've got a real boon here. A real boon here in Andrew. And she does a nice job. She was a writing fellow. I mean, this is, you know, we're doing this together this semester because she did such a fine job last semester in, well, I think you remember yeah, Brianna. She, and, uh, she's awesome. There that's you go. That's great. the spirit. Give her, you. yeah, that's right. A vote of confidence, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hard copy, please. Hard copy. Is that also for the first draft? Yes, for the first draft, please, please, for the first draft. And that comes due in class, so you'll be, it'll be a, um, a convenient way to get that to me. Just bring it, bring it for that class. You know what else I think? I think that what I see in student writing sometimes is inconsistency, by which I mean a given paper is not consistent unto itself. That in almost every paper that I see, there are some excellent points, excellent moments, an excellent couple of sentences there in paragraph three, which I think marks the level at which the entire paper could be written. And who knows why that is? I have no idea of your process. You know, the phone rang. And uh, you were called away, and you lost your train of thought, and could not, could not uh, reassemble it. I have no idea, but that impresses me. And I think you'll see that I mark good, good, good. You know, alongside, I don't understand this. This could have been rewritten <laughs> or whatever I put in the margins. Um, and that's it in part. Don't, don't be too rash to. Consider your paper finished. Set it aside, sleep on it. I, I know that you don't have all the time in the world, but try to make time to make sure that, that this paper is exactly what it could be. So anyway, you have any questions, any comments? By the way, it does look as though this course will be counted as a writing intensive course. Um, I went to the meeting of the committee that decides on those things the other day, and they seemed very positive to the idea. I think I will get some kind of positive word on that. And, and then that, well, I guess the question is not only whether it will be counted, but whether it will be retroactive for you. And I was told at the meeting that it, um, that it could be, that there was no problem. I just await official confirmation. And then, because writing intense, you have to take these various, I think there's global awareness and writing and so forth. You have to take these various um, courses under, with those specific markers. And what I'm saying is that <coughs> I am pretty sure that this course will have that marker. Yes? That's on the syllabus. Let me, let me read that to make sure. Hi there, Robert. Um, this paper was worth 10% of the final grade. The next paper will be worth 30% of the final grade. The final paper, which will be a little longer, will be worth 50% of the final grade. Attendance and participation, 10% of the final grade. And John, for you off campus, those are all going to be prorated in such a way that um, uh, you, will not, you will not be evaluated for attendance and participation, since the idea of this is that you are not attending. Other questions, other concerns, other comments? OK. You, can, are you able to understand what I wrote in the the little, I sent some of you a little letter almost about your, uh, about your paper. You, were you able to understand? Okay. Okay. Good, good. So you've got her now. You've had her all along, but you, uh, you may want to avail yourselves of her even more, our writing fellow. And uh, uh, I'm available as well. Uh, so, so, progress. Today, what you have in the um, reading assignment is uh, uh, a chapter of a book. 
book called Logics of History. This by the renowned historian of modern France, <coughs> history of society in modern France, William H. Sewell, Jr. And the title that you of the chapter that you read is, it, is Historical Events as Transformations of Structures, Inventing Revolution at the Bastille. Okay? Now, I would say that this that, that no doubt this chapter added very little to your understanding of the grand narrative of the French Revolution. You knew that the taking of the Bastille uh, has been regarded as an important event almost since the moment uh, it, it occurred. You certainly got more detail about, about that event. Um, you got a little more detail about the situation beforehand in Paris. And um, you got a discussion on the part of Sewell about this as an occurrence. And probably to be true to Sewell, we ought to begin to today to commit ourselves to observe his distinction between an occurrence and an event. An occurrence is something that happens. An event is something that effects the transformation of a structure. All right? So an, an event is something that you might be used to calling a turning point or something like that. And his point is that the taking of, of the Bastille was a, a, a turning point, so that, sort of a French version of the shot heard round the world, something like that. All right. Now, um, I, I thought I would go with you, first of all, to page 228 of this book and look at the definition that is suggested there. In fact, to lead into that, about five lines from the top of that page, and you, you will have seen this on Blackboard. I had this, I think, a, a file of this on Blackboard. Um, a single isolated rupture rarely has the effect of transforming structures because standard procedures and sanctions can usually repair the torn fabric of social practice. In other words, there are many occurrences that have the potential to become an event to effect this transformation of structure that for Sewell is so important. It's just most of them fail to do so because the structure has the, ha has the means, has the tendency to repair itself. So most potential revolutions never happen. You can look at it that way. Most potential revolutions never happen because somehow the, 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 the authority is able to reassert itself. All right? Now we get into his definition proper. A historical event, then, is one, a ramified sequence of occurrences that, too, is recognized as notable by contemporaries. We will get into that in a little bit and that three results in a durable transformation of structures. That's what makes it an event. That's what lends it importance. I jump down about um, eight lines. He says that his empirical example is a sequence of occurrences that took place in the summer of 1789 in France, what is generally known as the taking of the Bastille. All right, a sequence of occurrences um, none of them in and of itself adds up to an event, but taken together, they do. And that is what has given that series of sequences, that sequence of, of, of uh, occurrences, that is what has given them the, the title, the taking of the Bastille. All right. Now, first, to begin this idea of structure, let us look to France in the summer of 1787. Or, or consider, if you will, the two years leading up to the outbreak of the revolution, 1787, 1788, and into the early months of uh, the spring of, of, of 1789. If I asked you to speak about the structure of government in France, what would you say? What would you say? I mean, a uh, patriarchal monarchy. OK, OK, a monarchy. But one that's just struggling Okay, all like, right. I don't think people saw it as perfect just because of the money problem. But. Okay, well, no doubt I mean, there was a lot, there were misgivings about the structure, but, but the structure is given by monarchy. And one would go so far as to say absolute monarchy 
because what was not present? And what is an absolute monarchy or absolutist, as historians use the term? What does that mean? Only the, only the nobility have any say in how the country is run. Okay. Well, I mean, you put your finger on the nobility, and the nobility's the relationship of the nobility to the king strikes me as an important node of the structure. Yes. Okay, all right. An, absolute, an absolutist monarchy does not have the kind of counterweight that, for example, in, in what country there was a counterweight? In England, they had a constitutional monarchy. Okay, in England, they had a constitutional monarchy, in effect, and the counterweight was given by Parliament, and in particular, the lower house of Parliament, the House of Commons. There was no such thing in France. There had been no such thing in 16, since 1614, uh, 175 years before the outbreak of the revolution. But in 1614, a predecessor to Louis the 16th, in this case Louis the 13th, took a step that put France in the general direction of of absolutism. And what was that step? What did he do? What did he banish? What did he cease to convene? Cameron, I have a just one of these papers. Here you go. You're welcome. Pardon? General Assembly? You're close to the term. Huh? You're close to it. Estates General. Okay, the Estates General. And the Estates General consisted of the three estates, the clergy. Well, what were the other two? Nobility. Nobility. The rest. Everybody else with the understanding that everybody else would be dominated in the Estates General by members of the better off bourgeoisie, uh, merchants, lawyers, government officials, and so forth. But in any case, men who did not have the predicate of nobility. So when we talk about the structure of the old regime, the structure that existed uh, into the spring of 1789, we talk about a monarchy that was able to impose its will with little in the way of opposition from uh, the elite of the society, that elite being, of course, the, um, the, the nobility. Now, the nobility did have some means of counter pressure. For example, there were courts that were whose, uh, where, where judges uh, were all drawn from the, from the noble class. And, and at time they, times, they would enter into conflict with the regime, w with the monarch, over the registration of royal edicts, and there would be a back and forth. And that, that, that one's, one saw th throughout, the, uh, throughout the 18th century. But for the most part, Louis XVI ruled as an absolute monarch, and the efforts of the nobility to assert any kind of counterweight against royal authority came to naught. I mean, that would be the situation on the eve of the French Revolution if we spoke about, about government. Now, what if we turned the attention to, um, to society at large? I mean, what would you say was the structure of society? Let's start with your nobility, right? I mean, the nobility, no, I mean, tell me, I mean, structure suggests almost a, a, a visual image. Should we, should we see this as um, one that's an, an image that stretches out in a horizontal fashion, or is it vertical? Which works better, given the society in question? Well, there's a difference between what works better and what certainly did not work at the time. OK, well, what works better for us in our manner of description of that society as a structure? I mean, um, yes, pardon? OK, a triangle, uh, uh, a hierarchy, a pyramid, if you will. And, and if we say, well, at the very top of the pyramid, at the apex, is, of course, Louis XVI himself. And right below him would be, well, who? Pardon? You could say the clergy. And yet, the high positions in the clergy were reserved for whom? Nobility. For the nobility. So in a way, the first estate, which certainly is just below the monarch, has to be thought of as a monopoly or a preserve of the second estate. The nobility, in particular at its higher reaches. As far as the parish priest goes, well, he 
topples down into lower reaches of this hierarchy. All right, so you have at the top a nobility, in effect, and below them you have, well, the, the bourgeoisie, the, the commoners who by virtue of their wealth or their education have distinguished themselves. And, and then what? What below them? Peasants. All right, you have the peasantry, and that, that you could almost – Close the discussion there because that constitutes 85 to 90 percent of the population. But of course, the peasant below the peasantry, you have uh, laborers who do not have have land. You, you have all kinds of people. You have uh, vagabonds and beggars and prostitutes, and and they too fit into the social fabric or into the social hierarchy. But at the very bottom, and of course, in a town, you can't forget that there are people who are. Um, who have some measure of independence, uh, but certainly do not have the level of wealth that would assign them to the bourgeoisie. We call them petty bourgeoisie sometimes, lower bourgeoisie. Uh, this is the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. In other words, these are the tradespeople in the towns, and they too have to be remembered. Um, so, so it's a bit of, a, uh, of an awkward hierarchy. You're not really sure whether this immense peasantry ought to be put um, – uh, a little bit above or a little bit of, of below um, this rather small uh, trades class of tradespeople. But uh, in, in any case, they're situated there uh, in some awkward way beneath the bourgeoisie. And let's say that what we've, what we've offered so far is a static picture – and I emphasize static – a static picture of the structure that obtained in France on the eve of the Great Revolution. But in the same way that we could not speak about government without recognizing that the nobility constituted a force with discontent over its domination by the monarchy, so too can we not speak about the social order without an identification of some of its discontents, such as what? Who was discontented with what? Yes, Joe. Could you switch that uh, microphone for you? <laughs> the peasant class didn't, okay. didn't like paying their uh, – the, oh, I forget the name of it – their dues to the right. nobility. All right. All right. The, the dues that in the day were called feudal dues that the peasantry had to pay. And we've spoken about what they were. They, they were all man manner of obligations and, and payments that the peasantry had to, uh, had to offer to the, uh, to the nobility. Brian. Okay, I mean that certainly is true too. We can speak about what we spoke as a problem of governmental structure, as a problem of social structure as well. The nobility felt that its claims were not being acknowledged by the monarch. All right. Um, okay, so the, pe the, the peasantry has a, a, a grievance because it's sat upon by the lord. And we have to remember the lord can be the local nobleman, but the lord can also be the king. I mean, the king had extensive land. The Lord can also be the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church had extensive land. And um, in, in all of these relationships, the peasant felt sat upon, sat upon by the, um, uh, by the relationship to lords. I'm trying yes. to think back to Tackett, and there's another one. The bourgeois did not like being subordinate to the nobility. All right. There we go, too. There we go, too. What would be an example, Cameron, what would be an example of a bourgeois argument on the eve of the French Revolution against the nobility? Uh, that uh, they would believe more in meritocracy, that All right. uh, we're more educated than a lot of nobles, we're a lot more okay. uh, civilized than a lot of nobles. Okay. So we deserve to be in, a, in as high a place or a higher place. Okay. Oh, very good, very good. Yeah, you should be. You should have been an, uh, a bourgeois in 1788 because that's exactly how they looked at it. They thought of themselves as having more merit and more ability than the nobility. Then why should the privileges that the nobles enjoyed be continue to be enjoyed? So privileges such as what? What did the nobles have that even the most educated and wealthiest bourgeois did not? Okay. All right. Okay. 
taxes, exemption from, from the most important taxes of the realm. This in the midst of a financial crisis of the realm. Yes? There's a specific social circle that the nobilities get, or that the nobles get? Well, they did. They get advantages. Okay. Um, in terms of social, the, the, the pew that is reserved for them at church, the, the sumptuary laws that affect you know, what they can wear and what, what others cannot wear. You mentioned the titles. What were you going to say, Dean? I was going to say that they have to look very modest. Okay. Yeah, they, they certainly do. Um, they don't think it's enough, but nobles do staff the, the, the important courts of the realm, the parlement, and those are for the most part um, I mean, bourgeois. I mean, in many cases, uh, a, a bourgeois a, a attorney argues at court in front of noble judges whose knowledge of the law he finds inferior to his own. And if you multiply that experience by thousands, you begin to get an idea of the way in which friction could exist between a, a, a bourgeoisie coming into a sense of its own. Um, uh, of its own claim to position, to high position in France, uh, and a nobility whose high position was guaranteed by nothing more than tradition. Noble privilege did not seem in accordance with reason. And the Enlightenment supplied, if you will, a vocabulary to describe what was wrong about noble privilege. It's not rational. Yes. It, was this kind of a new friction because of the development of specialization and uh, skilled <coughs> labor and that kind of thing, L like lawyers and, and smiths and that kind of thing, where the bourgeois had the ability and skill to participate in the economy at an advanced level, even beyond the nobility, but that maybe didn't even exist a couple hundred years prior? Yes. And I, I, would, I, I would maybe eliminate the smith from your analysis, but if you look to the, to, to the merchant who, who's taking advantage of overseas opportunities for trade, such as in slaves, opportunities that had not existed before, let us say, the, the end of the 16th century, and, and wealth had been amassed that was unthinkable without overseas trade, which often you know, d depended, as we've seen in many ways, on slavery, and um, wi with regard to the, 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 the absolutism, to I mean, we've spoken about absolutism as a system of royal pretension as against the nobility, which it was, but one feature of royal pretension was to enlarge the number of officials in the state administration, in the bureaucracy, and this enlargement um, came to the advantage of bourgeois with educations. And so there were all kinds of you know, avenues for bourgeois advance socially that there had not been in prior centuries. Yes, Doom? Well, to the extent that they had, I mean, that was the thing, as long as the Estates General does not meet, um, the most important voting rights are being exercised by no one. There are, however, provincial assemblies in France and they tend to follow the pattern of the three estates that the estates general would have followed if it had ever been convened. And that is that the nobility has, the, um, has one vote, the clergy one vote, the bourgeois, the commoners one vote, with the understanding that each can, ver can veto um, what the other uh, reforms that the other wishes, which means that the nobility, though a t really a tiny portion of French society, um, something like 1% of, um, of France as a whole, the, the, the nobility can affect thwart reform, at least at this provincial level. And that's exactly the arrangement, of course, that, that inflames the bourgeoisie when the Estates General is finally called in May of 1789, um, because this bourgeoisie that has grumbled and grumbled about noble privilege the, the, these you know, 600 or so deputies from a class that has grumbled and grumbled about noble privilege um, have noble privilege staring them in the face. And their refusal to go along and then their decision to break away from the Estates General and establish the National Assembly, well, there we are at the Revolution. But of course, we're talking here about 
ab 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 about structure, uh, you know, on the eve of the French Revolution, let us say. And it's clear that there is a great deal of discontent in the society. We've mentioned the peasant discont discontent with feudal payments to the Lord, whoever the Lord may be. Um, we've identified noble discontent about their relative lack of power in regard to the monarchy, which we spoke of as a, as a governmental structural issue, but here we speak of as a, as, a, as a social structural issue. And we speak about the bourgeoisie as a class that is on the rise based on opportunities that have opened up to that, that, so to speak, history has opened up for it in the 150, 200 years before 1789, and uh, who believe that their time has come. That who want, who see in their success in business or their success in a profession such as the law, who see the kind of merit that Cameron emphasized when she focused upon meritocracy. Okay? So, yeah. My understanding that in England, through marriage and a certain amount of wealth, you could actually buy and move up into aristocratic titles. Was that possible in France? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And then you had the, uh, the ancient nobility uh, who would say to the newcomer, ah, in the year 1000, his ancestors were nothing. <laughs> So uh, it, to, to some extent, I mean, for some extent, there was sale to the royalty of noble titles. And um, there was actually a term at law, living like a noble, for a bourgeois family that perhaps over generations had pursued this strategy and was thought to be on the edge of ennoblement. Um, but there weren't enough positions to answer the demand. And, what, and one way to look at what happened in 1789 when they came to the actual abolition of noble privilege is that, um, that, that bourgeois deputies decided that, th that the weight was not worth it any longer, that what they needed was to undo a social structure uh, where they faced delay. Okay. So let me ask you about another question. Another question. And this, this changes, this is a, a question of a different order than either government or society, although certainly social privilege affects it. Food. What's the structure of food production and consumption? Remember our friend McPhee, the farmer from Australia. Yes. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So if we think of the resident of the relationship of peasant to landlord, or let's say after 1789, peasant to owner, uh, we're talking about social relationships, but we're also speaking about uh, disposition over food as a resource. What if that? Why was there a food crisis in the midst of the revenue crisis and the discontent of the nobles and the discontent of the peasantry? Why was there also a food crisis in 1789? They had poor yields in 77 yields. and 78, right? Uh, 78, 70, 80, 87 and 88, yeah. right, right. They had, and why? That means the poor yields would mean, of course, by supply and demand. Yes, Edmund. Yes, yes, yes. Ex uh, harsh winter conditions, good. Harsh winter conditions that reduced the harvest in many areas and shot the, the, the price of bread up through, uh, up through the ceiling. Now, I mean, bread riots had come and gone through the course of the 18th century. Uh, this was nothing new. But of course, the bread riots that took place in, um, let's say, the spring of 1789 uh, were bread riots taking, taking place in the midst of a larger crisis of government and society. And um, the, the rioters could sense that their discontent was in some proximity with other discontents around them. Yes, Brian. Does the have to do about food? The yep. 
right? Right, right, right. I mean, this, this of course, affected, and you, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And those of you who read the chapter from um, the book on you know, the global aspect of the French Revolution, uh, you, you, some of you read a chapter on the Eden Treaty of 1786 between, between Britain and France, uh, given the name because Eden was the name of the English negotiator. This was, in effect, a free trade treaty between the two. And it entailed that grain that had been harvested in France and that could be used to you know, satisfy the hunger of the French was being shipped to England uh, without the kind of traditional pr uh, protection that, that the monarchy would have offered. And it was, so to speak, a, a, a disaster of a time uh, in which to begin the experiment with free trade. But the experiment began, and of course it turned, it, it, it added a, a, an, an, an aspect of frustration, of political frustration, frustration with the politics of the regime to hunger, which of, was of course the root cause. All right. Now, um, what if we turned, um, and, and just to, to go back over the, uh, really, I guess, only to enlarge upon something that we said with regard to social structure in the years leading up to 1789, what about land? What about land? I mean, that, made, that, that, that mattered so much. I mean, we, we look back to a time when land mattered so much. I mean, I remember once years ago, I had a visitor from Europe. And the visitor from you, and I, for some reason I drove them out east, to like to eastern El Paso County, which then was far less developed than it is now, although it still has its rural aspects. And they, they were just stunned by all this land, all this land that you people have. And, and you know, they, they, they didn't see it any, in, in, in any, you know, heavy use. And uh, were wondering about, you know, what literally wanted to look into buying <laughs> <laughs> Some of it. Um, how different in France. Everything depended upon the produce of the land. I mean, there not, not only export in the sense, you know, the French wines, uh, Burgundy wines and so forth that, that went up for sale in, in Britain, but the, the, the well-being of this country depended upon wheat and rye. And those things were, those things were in tight supply by the spring of 1789, but who controlled the land? I mean, how do you even picture these relationships out there? We spoke about you know the lord and the peasant, but how do you picture this? Yeah, I think even today we feel much of that satisfaction in that <coughs> you work and live on this land, but you have no entitlement to it really. It, at the end, it can just be taken out from under you at any moment, and you're left with almost nothing. And that's where a lot of this discontentment and trust in the management of the system comes from. So you're speaking about France then? Yes. Okay. Or okay. Both then and today. How, just how people feel about it in general. Okay. That, that, that we feel that our land can be taken from us. Okay. Um, is, is this a comment about eminent domain? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I mean, at I mean, the time, you have you know the nobles who control the land, and you are you only have this sort of loan to it. But there's nowhere really for the for the peasant to live in a sense, except on this land that is owned by a noble. Okay. So I mean, in a sense, they are slaves to this master. Yeah. I mean, they certainly used the metaphor of slaves very freely in the late 18th century. The peasants did too, to describe their relationship to the lord. Picture it this way. Let's say that, I mean, just, just, just imagine this. Let's say that a truly large tract of land somewhere in the countryside in France, let's say in, the, in, the, in Alsace or in the Massif Central, let's say that uh, what exists on this large tract of land is a farm. It's the farm that is connected to the estate. That is, it is the Lord's farm. And, and around that farm are patches of land far smaller than the tract that I just described, but patches of land on each of which there is a peasant family. And depending upon the region, the peasant family has some <coughs> manner of obligation 
to the Lord. Now, this is not the depths of the Middle Ages. The peasant is not a serf. For the most part, the peasant does not have to um, seek permission to practice a trade or to marry, for example. But the, the peasant is on land that is connected with that estate. The peasant may actually be able to bequeath that land to a son. And I'm going to underline the word son because we're going to hit that issue with, with, with a passion in about a month. Uh, and and can, can actually um, sell it, perhaps, to another peasant. That is, to, to, to that degree, there is freedom in the control over this land, although what the other peasant buys into then is the same relationship to the Lord that the first peasant had to begin with. What is that relationship? Well, it might be that the peasant would have to work a certain number of days each year, each month, or each week on the Lord's farm. Right? That's the, um, that's the labor obligation that the peasant might, um, might have. The peasant would also then have <coughs> dues in cash or kind to the Lord. The peasant would also have these various obligations that we've spoken about, the banalites, by which the, if it was, let's say, a, a, a region where wheat or rye was produced um, at harvest time, the, the, the peasant's wheat or rye would have to go to the Lord's mill where it would be ground into flour. The flour would be then taken to the Lord's oven where it would ba be baked into bread. And at every turn and uh, on terms to the advantage of the Lord and not to the advantage of the peasant, something would have to be left there. Sacks of flour, loaves of bread, or whatever. Now, that's the situation that obtains on the e eve of the French Revolution. And you can imagine friction. And you can imagine friction over multiplied over millions of cases. And one could say, well, there were courts. There were local courts to which a, pe a, a peasant could go if, if the peasant felt that there was something unfair in the way the Lord was handling this relationship on the land. And yet, whose court was it? <coughs> whose court was it? It was the Lord's court. OK. <coughs> All right, so, so think about what we've done so far. We want to get to the taking of the Bastille, but so far what we've talked about is a number of structures because your author, Sewell, thinks in terms of structures. Government is a structure, but it, 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 it also is, the, is a site of contending forces, even if the monarchy has the advantage before the French Revolution over the nobility. Society is a structure. We described it, the pyramid, the hierarchy. But there are a number of cont contending forces. The relationship of peasant to lord, for example, of bourgeois to lord over the issue of noble privilege. We've spoken about food, and we've spoken about a factor that is you know, altogether different from factors we've considered so far, the factor of weather, the heavy winter, uh, the low harvest, the high price of grain, the introduction of free trade in grain um, in, in 1786, which worked to the disadvantage of the French consumer. And we, we've, we've spoken about that. And we've spoken also about the structure uh, with regard to the ownership of land to get a clearer idea of what, what kind of structure was there, uh, but also what kind of friction uh, characterized the structure. All right, OK. now. Back to our friend William Sewell. Remember him? William Sewell, right? He's the topic today. Um, well, I mean, you know the narrative to this point. The Estates General are called. There's a disagreement about the procedure by which the, the Estates General should meet, by which it should reach its decisions. Um, the king makes some concessions, but not enough to satisfy the third estate. The third estate breaks away, takes an oath, and proclaims itself as the National Assembly and the fount of authority, the, 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 the ultimate source of the law in France. It declares itself to be a body that has never existed before. Yes? So I may be overlooking something. However, how did the Third Estate, they were twice the size at the point that they broke, correct? Yeah. Which was part of their agreement. Um, but. How did the Part of the agreement they didn't agree to, but go well, on. <laughs> yeah. How did the other estates, like, let them do that? I guess, how did they just get away with that? Was it because they were just 
twice the size? No. I mean, that was their own decision. And there were nobles who went along, and there were parish priests who went along. Yeah. So that, by the, so that the National Assembly, can, um, by the time it constituted itself, had some liberal nobles, if I may use that term, mm -hmm. liberal nobles with it, and some uh, lesser members of, of, of the clergy. Um, I mean, this is all happening in such a short span of time. How did they do that? Well, my answer is, one answer I could give you, a counterfactual would be, they didn't. The king dismissed Necker, who was the, who was the reform finance minister, and sent about 20,000 Swiss troops <laughs> to disband them and had every last one of them hung. Because that's what could have happened. I mean, they had no balance of forces in their favor. None. Their vulnerability to royal assault was total. And we're talking about a short span of time, really um, weeks, in which, and the, the, the monarch thought he had gone far enough. He, he, had, he had doubled the size of the third. Well, that was quite a solution, wasn't it? You could double it, you could quadruple it, you could have you know, a million representatives of the third estate. But if the rule as regard to voting was not changed, it would still be the nobles and the clergy and the third estate. And anyone could, with a, with a power of veto, which meant that the nobles would control things. Which meant that the nobles would con control things. Yes? I think also to address his question, that the monarchy in particular, but the nobility as well, control all the mechanisms of power. Mm -hmm. They were the officers in the military. They pulled the economic levers. So that any kind of rebellion could be put down right. in any number of ways. Right. And that's what everyone thought was going to happen, or everyone in the assembly feared would happen as we turn to July the 14th, right? As we turn to the July the 14th. Yes? That was something that he did add that neither of the previous authors, at least that I didn't catch in them, that Louis had armed forces surrounding Paris. Right. He was ready to storm the city. Right, right. And so, um, and, and his concern, you know, the, the, the third estate with the National Assembly was, of course, still in Versailles. But the, um, but the city of Paris was the scene of rioting that had to do, you know, in large part, with, with um, food prices, but, but, but also with these customs stations. And those of you who read the articles on the economy about smuggling and um, the, the way in which um, custom stations came under attack because they tried to prevent smuggling and tried to arrest smugglers, you, you will have sensed the, the importance of that mention in, um, uh, in William Sewell. But, um, all right, so the National Assembly seems vulnerable. Paris seems vulnerable. There really are no troops at the disposal of the National Assembly. There are no for, no, no, no troops, no regular troops at the disposal of the crowds in Paris. And it looks as though Louis is about to carry out a massive strike against, um, against both. In any case, that is the fear. All right, now let's reconstruct. Let's go through this step by step with William Sewell. I turn with you now to page 236. Uh, this is his, his conclusion. Um, this is about the middle of the page, and it, it, it's really the last several lines before that next section. Let me read. To make sense of the taking of the Bastille as a historical event, then, we must determine when, how, and why the happenings of July the 14th, 1789 came to be understood as a revolution in which the people rose up, expressed its sovereign will, and transformed the political system of the nation, or to put the same thing a different way, when, how, and why these happenings effected a durable articulation of popular violence and popular sovereignty in the new category of revolution. In other words, when did people come to realize that what happened at the Bastille struck a blow against the monarchy, at least the absolute monarchy, and that the people exercising 
popular sovereignty had stepped in in such a way that they altered the political balance of forces in the country. When did that happen? When did people become aware that it had happened? And how did it happen? That's the question here. Because you could say, again, the counterfactual, look, <laughs> as I, in the same way that I answered Austin uh, a moment ago, I could say, what happened on the 14th of July, 1789? That's easy. The crowd had muskets and they needed ammunition, and the ammunition, the, the powder was at the, uh, at the Bastille. Next question. You could say it that way. And this didn't have to be the turning point. You know what set me on the, on the, on the right path to understand that? I was in the fifth grade, and my teacher, Mr. Brown, you may think, wow, Sackett remembers when he was in the fifth grade. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, we had just begun schooling. <laughs> and um, in this little, you know, one room school, no, it was not. <laughs> but in any case, Mr. Brown said that the midnight ride of Paul Revere had had its importance blown all out of proportion in the American Revolution. And that sat with me. And I thought, wow, then that really wasn't the way, you know, you read about it. You have these little textbooks and so forth. That really wasn't the, the way that you read about it, okay? That sometimes events get blown, blown out of proportion. But sometimes events are, sometimes events are trans, yeah, well, are, are transformed to, um, to a level of importance that they do not have. But one way to read Sewell is to say, an event, events can be, that any event can be, can be seen as having less importance than it's later seen to have. Yes? I'd almost argue the reaction to the Civil War was more important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. They could have taken it and they could have all just, oh, let's run away before they get here, but instead put the heads on pikes right in front of yeah. the just as a victory. It's like we are taking back our children, and there was no, we don't regret this, and we're going forward yeah. from here. Yeah. They ran off after that. It would have been King Ford's little march in before yeah. it would have been done. There you go. And in fact, your author, Sewell, sees a series of events between the 14th of July, 1789, and the 20th of July, 1789, a series of events that have all been given the heading of the taking of the Bastille by kind of um, stylistic simplification to describe what, what in fact happened in France. Yes? I think the other thing, in addition to what you talked about, is the number of the forces within the Bastille actually turned in favor of the peasantry. They, yeah. If they didn't aid them, they at least didn't resist yeah, them. Yeah, the, of the urban crowd. So That's when, right. When the king realized he had no control. In the That's country. right. That's right. So let's celebrate on the 14th of July, 1789 in France, the soldier's treachery. Long live the soldier's treachery. Because you can, you can dissect this series of events up to about the 20th of July any which way, and the, 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 the taking of the Bastille is only one discrete set of occurrences um, within them. Let's, um, let's look on here. Okay, 237. And we get the idea, all right? The, 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 the soldiers let down the drawbridge, but by that time there had been um, dozens of, of casualties out in front of the Bastille because the governor of the Bastille had ordered that they be fired upon. Uh, prisoners were released, what was it, uh, three forgers and th four madmen, or four, four forgers and three madmen, I can't remember. Hence, so much for the release of the prisoners. And the powder that they needed for their, the ammunition that they needed for their, for their muskets was taken, and then events moved in the direction that, that you were talking about. All right, top of 237, the first steps toward articulating popular violence and popular sovereignty were made in Paris, if not during the assault, then in actions and commentary immediately afterwards. Okay, there we come to the point. Certain ritual actions and the events themselves seem to indicate that the crowds claim to act on behalf of the nation. Thus, the popular newspaper, Les Révolutions de Paris, reported that one of the first acts of the men who had captured the Bastille was to seize and display, quote, the sacred flag of the fatherland to the applause and the transports of an immense crowd of people. So someone in this crowd 
decided that this was the time to hoist the flag. We're not given a name or names of the people who decided this, but it was decided. And that gave a kind of political coloration to it that perhaps otherwise it would not have had. I go down to the bottom of the paragraph. Les Révolutions de Paris used the highly charged term citizens to designate the attackers. Right? They could have said the mob. They could have said the rabble. Um, who, who you were, who you, let's see, which was the one that you wrote on, wasn't it? It was um, Colson, right, who used that term to describe the mob at first, <laughs> or the people, the mob, the rabble, but no, the citizens. So all of a sudden it has this revolutionary ring to it in, 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 in a journalistic account. All, um, and then soldiers of the nation, right? They're not, you know, rabble um, exceeding the bounds of authority. They're soldiers of the nation. We go on. All this implies that the Parisians drew upon the notion of popular sovereignty to assert the legitimacy of the taking of the Bastille. There's such a thing as the nation and these demonstrators, these men and women who took the Bastille are its soldiers. So all of a sudden language is giving the key to the importance that begins to be attached to the event on, um, let's see, I think the next day. But simply identifying the attack on the Bastille as an expression of the will of the people did not amount to inventing the modern concept of revolution. Right? We're not there yet. We're not there yet. They could have been decried as villains. They were praised as heroes. And they hoisted the flag. But we're not there yet to talk about a new political system on the basis of the fact that they, A, freed seven prisoners, B, um, executed the governor of the, of the fortress, and um, C, hoisted the flag. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But in the, in, in, in the atmosphere of the time, in the way people began to speak about this event, all of a sudden, the right words are being pinned onto it. The right words are being attached to it. The, the nation, uh, the city. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. I didn't see your hand. When, when he, uh, he makes a big deal out of the idea of ritual. Yeah. And the, the hoisting of the flag and what he was talking about with regard to the, the heads on, heads the, on the pike. Heads on the pike, yeah. Those are actually sort of institutions that the, the king had formerly done yeah. to impress people with yeah. his power and control. Yeah. And then they were doing it in his face. Yeah, yeah. Right. In the stead of the king. So they, they, there's not even any words that we know of that the crowd attached to this. It's as though they perform the ritual action that traditionally had been performed to assert the king's justice, the king's authority. And all of a sudden, this crowd has executed its justice and has stuck these heads on pikes to to demonstrate their authority, and all of a sudden it starts to look like new power. New power. Now, the king could have sent in troops and put the whole thing to an end, and your author points that out, that many events, I'm sorry, many occurrences, <laughs> many happenings, look as though they have the potential to rise to the level of events, but never do because the authorities squash them. In this case, it did not happen. So the whole thing can develop its merry way. But I point out, we're only part way there. As, as far as we know, on July the 14th, no one thought that popular sovereignty had been asserted. They thought that the will of the people, the will of the nation, had been asserted. But they saw no implication of this for government structure. And that will come. That will come. Um, let's see. To we go ahead to page 238. Um, yeah, OK, here you go. First of all, we've got to turn to the assembly now. And the assembly is shaking in its boots already because of the implications of, royal, uh, of this sort of royal show of power for it. What's the assembly think when word comes that the Bastille has been entered and the governor of the Bastille has been executed and there's been some kind of demonstration in the center of Paris. What does the assembly think? What's its first response? Hooray, we are saved? First response is that now the king's going to send his soldiers and kill them all. All right. Okay. Now this will be the provocation that will bring the king 
to send his troops not only into Paris to put down this demonstration or riot, call it what you will, but this will be the prompt for the king to send his troops against us, against the National Assembly. That's the first response. Oh my God, we're done for. Okay, now to the 15th of July, right? To the 15th of July, right? If this were a television program, we'd have these little captions going in front. <laughs> All right, 10 lines from the bottom. Meanwhile, a delegation from the assembly went to Paris on the afternoon of the 15th and found that far from seething with violent hatred, the capital was bathed in the glow of a joyous and generous patriotism. Ha! Huh. Mounier, who reported on this visit on the morning of the 16th, this Mounier being one of the, 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 the deputies of the National Assembly, described in rapturous tones the delegation's reception in Paris. The Parisians attempted by the most vivid signs of affection to express, and I quote, this is from Mounier's speech, to express the sentiments weighing upon them. It was a great joy for them to shake hands with a member of the National Assembly. Citizens congratulated and embraced one another. Note, citizens, not the mob, not the rabble, not the common people, citizens. A, ter a term of, 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 of dignity and a term with a political charge. All eyes were wet with tears. Intoxicated sentiment was everywhere. Then Murni goes on, top of uh, Mounier, excuse me, top of page 239. Monnier began to rethink the violence of the 14th. Regrets are surely due for all the troubles that the capital has suffered. May she never again see these terrible moments when the law has lost its empire. But may she never again feel the yoke of despotism. She is worthy of liberty. She has earned it by, by her courage and energy. Okay, I read on in the voice of Sewell now rather than, quote, massacres and bloody executions, which have carried the people, now onto Meunier, have carried the people to an excess of fury that is very difficult to stop. Meunier spoke of the violence euphemistically as the troubles that the capital has suffered. Right, it is kind of a euphemism, you know, mincing words. And those, he downplays what as a member of the bourgeoisie and a member of the assembly he must have he must have despised. He downplays it because he's given it this political cast. These were citizens. Indeed, he hailed it courage and energy. Nor in Mounier's rendering does the just, nor is this disorder. And I quote from him again. Again, this is a speech delivered to the assembly in which someone who has been to Paris to take stock of the situation describes it, but in ways that both put a fine color upon the common people in Paris and begin to develop an idea of the political significance of what has happened. That's where we're headed for, isn't it? The idea that this has political significance. That's where, where we're headed for. Because we know that you know Paris was a violent place. Things like this could happen. But all of a sudden, a speaker to the assembly that has designated itself as the fount of law and authority in France puts this different light on it. Among the people's acts of despair, even while weeping for the death of several citizens, it will perhaps be difficult to resist a sentiment of satisfaction upon seeing the destruction of the Bastille. That's not the way they spoke two days before, is it? There on the ruins of that horrible prison, there will soon be erected according to the wishes of the citizens of Paris. There's a phrase to underline. The statue of a good king, the restorer of the liberty, and the happiness of France. In other words, they've almost been cast in the role of the guarantors of a constitutional monarchy. Look at, how, look at the extent of the change in two, two days. You start to get the idea how it is that the taking of the Bastille, which passed with, with a kind of you know, ambivalent evaluation of it on July the 14th by July the 16th is, well, the taking of the Bastille has become the taking of the Bastille. Um, 
then this is uh, Sewell again, jumping down two lines. As early as the 16th, the taking of the Bastille was spoken of in the National Assembly, not only as a justified response of the people to despotic oppression, but as a crucial step toward a new political order. In Meunier's speech, we begin to discern not just a new attitude toward the popular violence of July 14th, but a sanctioning of the Parisian uprising as a legitimate revolt of liberty against despotism. That's what they did. That's what they did. I mean, in effect, heroes have been made. Revolutionary heroes have been made. Um, after a few days of uncertainty, how do we evaluate this? Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating to see, to see the, the way that history works. Makes me wonder if I were back in the fifth grade, what, um, what the real explanation would have been about the midnight ride of uh, Paul Revere. Anyway, let's, take, let, let's come back at 3 o'clock. Let's take a few minutes and, and come back to this. Um, because believe me, I mean, you know, this is a course on the French Revolution. But I mean, the same thing. If this were a course in Nazi Germany, we could be talking about the seizure of power, right? Uh, um, you know, history presents these events to which enormous significance is attached. And how did they come to be given that significance? Yes? I don't want to eat into our break time. But I look at Louis, he, he was actually trying in some way while holding on to power to implement reform. Be this author doesn't talk about the Cahier. Yeah. But by doing that, by convening the Estates General, by not suppressing with military force. He had something in mind. He was trying to achieve something. He had something in mind. I mean, Tackett goes on beyond this point in the narrative, and he does look um, deceitful. So in, in, for example, in, in toward the end of the Legislative Assembly in regard to the Constitution, you know, he pledges his support and then tries to escape. And then he pledges his support and then conspires with enemies of the revolution. Um, so you think he was just trying to w use popular leverage against? Yeah, hard to say. I think he didn't see what, where this was headed. I think he did not see where this was headed. Okay. So, so more stupid yes. than enlightened. <laughs> Is he covering his yeah. backside? Yeah, covering his backside. Covering his backside. I mean, why provoke people if the prov if the people might have the, you know, have the force sufficient to attack? Anyway, let's uh, take ten minutes and then come back. To this, okay.
<laughs> and exhausted right now. Like the art stuff. How many comics? We'll show it back in the show. All of them. I don't even know what that is. Or you should be able to just, just say, there is no crime. There is no individual crime. But it's pretty clear that it's not. Just throwing it in the air. Oh. I think this is never wrong on you for just throwing it in the air. Yeah, I think, well, like just start, page, start one. page one with, with Arabic numerals. And <laughs> that, that seems to me to be perfectly, I'm not sure that I, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I've ever seen that come in from a student. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to be something that you learn in school and mm -hmm. you like at home and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So it's not like we, we're not going to be there for the whole class period. No, just 20 minutes or 15 maybe. I don't know. Sure. And that's just kind of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then we're going to be like, oh, it's your lunch break. But if, and that's if we drop it off. Mm -hmm. Or like, so if we want to drop it off earlier, yeah, uh, well, that's what Andrea was just telling me. I'm not sure, like, that, that may be, that's graduation day, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, or is so, it yeah, no, I'm not going to, so I'm going to require that you miss graduation. No. <laughs> no. So, if we could flexible. Yeah, yeah, that's flexible. I mean, you know, just before or, or, you know, any other kind of arrangement you want to make. So, yeah, so I'm not blocking your an important life event so or should we call it an occurrence <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Hmm.
says edit like right next to it. Yeah. Like <coughs> and wait. On Google Docs? Yeah. Alright, you know, just hold on. I'll figure this out. What are you doing at what class? Are you Well we could con uh, continue in the vein where we were working, and um, <coughs> we could um, continue through these speeches in the assembly. There were more than other speeches that followed that by um, by, by Mounier, but, but the point is that by by July the twentieth, there really had been from the <laughs> National Assembly a full acknowledgment that this was the, an exercise of popular sovereignty whose effect would be a change in the form of government. That in effect the taking of the Bastille laid the foundation for a new form of monarchy, which then the Constituent Assembly went on to, uh, to, to try to finalize in the form of a constitution, which as you know came in, in 1791. So what, what could have been described as a wild act of crowd violence by rabble on July the 14th um, was by July the 20th um, an, 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 a glorious act by which the, which the people had asserted its li liberty and laid the basis for a new form of government that would constitute the balance of power that the National Assembly wanted. I mean, quite a turn of events. And as I point out, the taking of the Bastille became, therefore, the taking of the Bastille. I turn with you to the summary that um, Sewell himself offers at the end of page 244. By the 20th, the evolution of the balance of political forces had not only made it unthinkable for the Assembly's majority to criticize the violence of July 14th, which they had done on July 15th, we remember. Yes. So would the taking of the Bastille be considered a turning point because the peasants were the group? The, the crowd. Pe peasants are country. Or is it because yeah. the policymakers, the new political regime, took advantage of that and made it into it? I would say the latter. I mean, there, there had to be something for them to take advantage of. There, there had to be something for them to reinterpret. There had to be something for them to mark as a decisive act of popular sovereignty. Um, that secured their own power. Because I would say, could it have been another event instead of just this specific one? I think yes. Mm -hmm. I think yes. That um, I any event can serve okay. <laughs> unless the authorities okay. respond in such a way to quash the movement, which in this case the authority did not do. There was nothing intrinsic to the taking of the Bastille, by which I mean the physical events themselves, nothing intrinsic to it that marked it with the significance that the assembly would give it over the course of the next several days. And because the assembly stayed in power and because the French Revolution kept moving forward and because of the Constitution in 1791 and because of the Republic and because of Robespierre and because of everything that happened thereafter, there was never a block to that line of events, if you will, that line of historical events. And in that way, the taking of the Bastille came to be seen as the crucial turning point, and is still seen that way. If you need proof, show up in Paris on July the 14th. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could just, uh, if UCCS could just offer you all a vacation in France in July and you could uh, take stock of the issue yourself. <laughs> they celebrate like mad <laughs> the taking of the best deal. Yes. With regard to the publishing of the pamphlets and stuff, right? I mean, yeah. he never suppressed that. No, he never did. And w one of the things, I'm looking ahead now to this assignment on, on the family by the historian Suzanne Vessan. There, I mean, there was a, 
the, there, there was a profusion of pamphlets, petitions, newspapers uh, from the beginning in the French Revolution. And her interest is on pamphlets, for example, that deal with the question of divorce or um, the, the rights of the priesthood to, mar to, to marry, to break the vow of celibacy, or that uh, uh, shift the power within marriage to the woman with regard to property. Just an outpouring of all kinds of literature, more or less serious on, this, on questions like these. But yes, then all, all of a sudden Paris was just awash in, 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 in literature, in pamphlet literature, more than it had been before the revolution. Newspapers proliferated, yes. Fighting time and waiting to see how everything was going to be taken. Yeah. Because it sounds like it, it really could have gone the other direction. Yes. And I think that they were surprised themselves at the reaction of the, the citizens. Yes. To them. Yes, altogether. Described by everything that happened. Described that it did not end in immediate disaster. Mounier described by the attitude that he found on the streets of Paris. And you could say, well, well, that's because he went around the right corner. If he'd gone around the other corner, he would have found, you know, s snarling, angry Parisians and would have had a different idea. But yes. I think, I think um, he touches on they were really turned off by how violent that it had yeah. become, and they weren't sure how that was going to play out. That's right. And their fear of crowd. I mean, you get back to Tackett, who a analyzed just the sheer roughness of the city of Paris um, in, in, in the 1780s and the way in which this class, the bourgeoisie, but in particular bourgeois deputies looked at crowd violence with, with a great deal of anxiety. And he points out that they had, that, that they had nothing against capital punishment in, in cases of extreme violence such as in this case the Parisian crowd was showing. So their immediate response was not to embrace it, but to reject it. Yes? We talked last time about Robespierre. Would you say that climate is what allowed him to go where he went, to become so violent and to just... Well, I think so. I, I, I think so. I mean, um, Tackett really, I think, pr approaches that question from two angles at once. One is, what kind of a man was Robespierre? Um, he was smart. He was eloquent. He was arrogant. And he was incredibly sensitive on the point of criticism. So we've got, we've got Robespierre's part in this, how it is that he had the b basic um, a attitude of needing to carry out some kind of reprisal against enemies. I mean, his arrogance instructed him that he was the embodiment of the revolution. But the other side of that is Robespierre, as he encourages the crowd, then to some extent has to meet the crowd's proclivity for violence. But it, if you were to look at a timeline, I'm trying to piece this together. Yes. It was the, the response in general of the government to the Bastille. That's the when Robespierre rose, isn't it? Uh, I mean, he certainly, he's, he's prominent in the assembly. Mm -hmm. um, I think he, re he, he rose later in the framework of the Jacobin Club. Okay. I mean, I'm going to shut this door for a moment. The, um, Ro Robespierre was not a member of the legislative assembly. Um, that was an entirely new set of politicians. His standing came in the Jacobin Club, uh, where he made the kind of contacts that would um, that would really constitute a large part of his popular base of support in the convention. On. A little later on, I mean, I doubt that many in uh, the assembly. I mean, he was. I mean, he's quoted here. He he gave a speech also on the occasion of the Bastille, and he also uh, supported the taking of the Bastille. But <laughs> in the same way that. We've seen the taking of the Bastille become the taking of the Bastille. I think we also, in this course, see Robespierre become Robespierre. 
I mean, he's, he, he's an important member of the assembly. He tends to the left. He's a member of the Jacobin Club. Um, so he's, so to speak, a radical at every uh, step of the way. But this idea that he would be the central figure, that really uh, awaits the, uh, the convention. And for no other reason than he was not even a member of the National, of the, excuse me, of the uh, Legislative Assembly. So, okay. Yeah. You know, Sewell likes theory. He's an historian by trade, but, but he has a joint. He, at the University of Chicago, he had a joint appointment, didn't he? What does he call himself? The Frank P. Dixon Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of History and Political Science. Okay. So he's, he's, he's got this, he straddles, if you will, history, which is often regarded as one of the humanities and political science, which is a social science. And in, in, in this dual interest, he wants to um, d describe and analyze and interpret events, which is, I think, often conceded to be the forte of the historian. But he also wants to um, develop dialogue to build a bridge with social science. He thinks that through an analysis, of, uh, a careful analysis of the taking, Basti of, the take, taking of the Bastille, there are the elements that could inform a theory of event in his sense of the term. That is a theory of the, you know, what, when does an, does an event become an event? When is it, when is it a turning point? And I, I just thought we'd look through some of that um, and reflect on, in other words, that you, you'll, you'll find his, his hypothesis is that you will find um, this kind of turn, the, the, this kind of dynamic to an event, if you study history differently, you know, in a different area, like, th like let's say this were a course in Nazi Germany, and we'd be talking about the Nazi seizure of power, or this were a course in Russia, and we'd be talking about the Bolshevik Revolution, and we would find the same type of uh, aspects to the event that we find in the French Revolution, that he has here the makings, the ingredients of a of, of a theory, a generalization. Um, he says, for example, um, okay, all right, bottom of page 244, historical events, rearticulate slate structures. Well, <clears throat> as long as this set France on the course toward a constitutional monarchy, I think everyone can see that idea. An absolute monarchy <coughs> is being converted into a constitutional one, and all right, that's in his terms the rearticulation of a structure. Then on page 245, Historical events are cultural transformations. And he goes on to talk about the, you know, the, the, the symbolism that was replete in the event, the hoisting of the flag and so forth, the emphasis given to the word citizen, you know, language being so crucial to culture, that, that, that value is articulate then in the word citizen, which was used to describe the, the people who could otherwise just be described as rioters. Um, he goes on on page, and I jump ahead here a little bit, 248, 249. Heightened emotion. Aha. Heightened emotion. Now, what in what we have seen so far would you call heightened emotion? Aside from the fact that the assembly was scared half out of its wits, which I would agree is heightened emotion. What, what else? I mean, I think that played a role in almost every piece of the revolution. Yeah. Just the emotions and mindsets that people got stuck into, they never left. They yeah. Were so adamant about okay about how they felt that they weren't willing to sway one way or the other. Okay, the strong emotion that attends a strong political commitment. Okay, you're right. You're right. How about the emotion that Mounier found when he came to Paris on the 15th and that he reported in his speech to the assembly? on the 16th. How about that emotion? Isn't it great? I mean, you think, you know, a, a novelist wrote this. Or, you know. I mean, their, their manner of speaking is so effusive in, in, in the late 18th century. Um, I mean, you, you, you really think, you really would think that, uh, you know, Emily Bronte wrote these lines or something like that. <laughs> what, what about that? What did he say? What did he say? What did he, he came back to the 
to the assembly, what did he say about popular emotion? Did you notice that? It's quite mar remarkable. The Parisians attempted by the most vivid signs of affection to express the sentiments weighing upon them. It was a great joy for them to shake hands with a member of the National Assembly. Crit citizens congratulated and embraced one another. All eyes were wet with tears. Intoxicated sentiment was everywhere. Now you've seen that kind of description, haven't you? I mean, as you look through those individual testimonies that Packett sprinkles through his books, they're, they're always speaking in that kind of, like uh, Rosalie Julien has plenty of passages that, that sound like that. Well, all right, that was a manner to describe, um, let's say, to articulate and to describe emotion in the late, in the late 18th century. Um, I mean, Rousseau, for example, was forever describing himself bursting into tears. They were stoic. They weren't stoic, right? <laughs> yes. And then the, the, the question is, what, the question arrived, what do we do with these other soldiers? Of course, veterans who were on the, given that duty at the fortress and from, you know, kill them too to a sort of a wave of generosity sweeping through the crowd and, the, you know, their embraces that follow and so forth. Talking about, you know, survival out of the jaws of death. But, um, well, I mean, let's follow, I mean, this is, this is not a course on, you know, the theory of revolution, but let's follow Sewell where he wants to go just for a moment. Does this ring true to you? Does this ring true to you? I mean, think of the 500 events that you have studied closely. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> think, of, think, of, think of the history you have studied and when you have encountered something like this. Um, is, it a, is, is, is great emotion... Um, does great emotion attend, attend it? People display emotion perhaps in a way where usually they are more reserved. Would you say so, Dylan? Absolutely. I think, for example, what? I mean, it's a list, but yeah. For instance, like the American Revolution. All right. Less, well, most, a lot of people would. But All right. Okay. So th there are a lot of displays of emotion. <laughs> Uh, em embraces, shedding of tears, and so forth, that um, otherwise would not, or otherwise people would not have the occasion to express them. Yes. I would think even if you look at um, September 11th. Okay, September 11th in this country. You know, Good example. Standing and the emotional, the shock and the disbelief yeah. and the the anger, all okay. those things provoke. A political response. Okay, but this, these kinds of responses too. Did people, um, did people who had never seen one another before embrace on the street? In the case of 9/11, yes. Okay. 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 That was. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, and if they slammed the door when they left, that would really be <laughs> an expression of emotion. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, there are these moments when people express emotion that, that you know, that, we're, that, that stand out through the expression of emotion. You usually expect them to be more reserved. Um, here, of course, we're on a grand stage. This has to do with the government of France and with popular involvement in, I mean, it's hard for me to say whether the people who had actually stormed the Bastille were caught up in this understanding of the event or not. Um, but in any case, it was being given that significance by journalists at the time, people who wrote that newspaper, but also by these members of the assembly who had vacillated and then, ah, mon citoyen, oh, my citizen, you know, that kind of expression. You know, um, honestly, I would say there was a lot of that in Nazi Germany when, the German, when, when Hitler came to power. Now, 
I mean, revolutions are not time. Well, whether the Nazi the seizure to power was a revolution, we could talk on and on about. But whatever we'd say, it was certainly regarded as an important event as when it took place, and not everyone was behind it. But not everyone was behind it. We don't have, you know, the, you know, the, the a prince of the realm. Um, in the streets of Paris, embracing the common people. The prince of the realm was probably horrified and angered by what had happened. <coughs> but the, the assembly suddenly saw an ally in the streets of Paris. Yes? I think when you're talking about that kind of thing with regard to whether it's the Nazis or this situation, the general population was under a great deal of duress. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of, of stress and tension and, yeah. and discontent. And, and Germany was that way too because of the austerity of the way they had been dealt with. Yes. So whether it was the, the proliferation of pamphlets and, and newspapers in Paris or in Nazi Germany, all of a sudden you have nationwide radio. Yeah. The whole population is allowed to swell at once. Right. I mean, we have to remember that the whole population also included uh, communist and socialist deputies who were trying to avoid um, arrest and placement in a concentration camp, right. and Jews who were starting to wonder. But yeah, I mean, the, the part of the population that is open to see this as a great event then becomes very effusive emotionally. And that's, that's, that's what's typical of it. Nazi Germany, France in 1789. Yes? Well, I think in both cases. Yeah. I mean, people were hungry, extremely so, in both cases. And there was, like, poverty and there was um, definitely the sense of national debt um, in both situations. And I think people can, can, um, can uh, take advantage of that when they're thinking of their emotions. Good. So if I'm the one to come in and I give you bread and you haven't had bread yeah. for, you know, a couple of weeks, I mean, you're kind of going to be on my side. And remember, no bread has changed hands. But it can feel to a crowd. But I mean, I'm not sure that Mounier brought anybody bread mm -hmm. when he came to Paris on the 15th of July. But suddenly the crowd can feel that there's this bond in the National Assembly and that the National Assembly will, I think someone's trying to get in, the National Assembly um, is trying to, I thought I heard, oops, they left. Um, the National Assembly is trying to act on, uh, trying to act for in the interests of the people, and no doubt bread will come, something like that. But really, if you think about it, you, you, ever, you know what Prague in 1968 was? Does that ring a bell with me? OK, Prague in 19, anyone, anyone? Well, think back now. <laughs> well, I can think back. Um, yeah, it was the, the spring and summer of 1968. Czechoslovakia was, of course, in the communist empires behind the Iron Curtain. and. Um, all of a sudden, I mean, you know that the history of the Iron Curtain was punctuated by occasional uprisings. Uh, the 17th of June, 1953, for example, in, in, Ger in East Germany, there was an uprising against the Soviet Union, the, 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 communist, um, the communist power that kept these, kept these countries in line as members of the, uh, of the communist alliance. Uh, Hungary in 1956. Well, Czechoslovakia in 1968. Suddenly, um, th th there was a kind. There was a, there was a, a revolution, albeit thwarted, when a liberal member of the regime named Alexander Dubček became the oh, what did he become prim prime minister or president? In any case, he became the head of state of Czechoslovakia, and he was going to institute all kinds of reforms. Um, more or less in line with what Mikhail uh, Gorbachev instituted in Russia 20 years later. This is called, in, in German, der Prager Frühling, the Prague Spring. And w when you talk to people, I mean, Czechoslovakia is right there. In fact, I went to Czechoslovakia some years later after the, you know, the gate had shut again. But, um, I mean, people were, were euphoric. They were euphoric. It was like a popular festival. Um, you know, everyone who, who, who besides, of course, communist diehards who, you know, hated this development, um, 
everyone thought that this was a turning point. We've become an open society. The, you know, there will be relaxation of the controls of the economy. Um, you know, long live Alexander Dubček. And then in August of that year, the Soviets sent in troops and the whole thing was, you know, put an end to. That's why, you know, do you call it a revolution or not? Well, it was thwarted after some months. And Dubček ended up in some, I don't know, provincial author provincial government office in, in Slovakia, which is the, they were then combined, you may know, what is now the Czech Republic and Slovakia were combined in one state. And, but, but the, what I'm trying to get at here is not what happened to Dubček and that, that effort at change. What I'm trying to get at is that you do have this, this, you know, uh, this sort of effervescence of feeling. That's a term that your author points out was used by the great French sociologist Emile Durkheim toward the end of the 19th century. Effervescence of feeling. And yeah, I mean, that just seems to be part and parcel of these great moments. Years ago, years ago, how many here are veterans of my class, History 1040? Anyone here? <laughs> yeah, you, Cassidy, you took 1040. Um, who else? Who else is in that class? No? No one? That's, that's the intro class, my intro to modern Europe. You took that. Okay, okay. Well, uh, years ago, I mean, I've changed that class. I, you know, I, I'm quite fickle with that. I'm always, you know, it's like the quest for the Holy Grail for me. I'm always changing the syllabus, changing. But years ago, I... I, I, let's see, how did I do this? Oh, yeah, yeah, it had, anyway, there was kind of a module on the Russian Revolution, and I had a nice book of documents about women in the Russian Revolution, edited by Sheila Fitzpatrick, and <laughs> then the crowning assignment was uh, every student had to pick a section from this book of documents and write <laughs> a kind of proto-research paper based on these documents. And the ones who picked, and they were documents from all kinds, of all kinds, Russian aristocrats, women, who had to flee for their lives in the dead of winter to avoid you know, capture by the Bolsheviks. Um, but, but also ordinary working women on the streets of Paris who, th there was a kind of honeymoon relationship with the Bolshevik party. They, 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 mean, they mean bread, they mean peace. Um, I mean, that was Lenin's slogan, bread, bread, land, and peace. And um, yes, there was this kind of, I mean, some of them articulated in um, various sorts of documents like, uh, you know, memoirs that they later produced, Th this kind of feeling of excitement, feeling of excitement. And I think if you go around the world and you find these moments of great transition, um, uh, <coughs> I'm not, I make no claim to be an expert on South Africa, but when Nelson Mandela came to power, was there not this kind of excitement? Um, Moments like that, moments like that. Um, I think that the civil rights movement in this country, um, I mean, I would have to talk to Dr. Harvey who would have a more refined sense of this, but up to the assassination of Martin Luther King, I think it produced many such moments uh, of a kind of euphoria of people um, living outside of the bounds that they were used to, to, used to living in, and then all of a sudden there's this um, there's this excitement, you know, people, people speak to each other on the street in a way they never had before. Um, <coughs> the American Revolution, I mean, when the Civil War came to an end in the North, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, par parades uh, of, you know, vic of vic victory parades in the United States, I mean, you've, you've seen pictures of those. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm open to the idea that we're sometimes led down the prim, primrose path by the media that show us pictures of things and, you know, the, the, the reality was, was, was felt to be different at the time. But I have no doubt that when the war was finally over, not just in Europe but in Asia, that there was a kind of euphoria. I mean, are there cases of, you know, men meeting women on the streets of New York City and they married and, you know, <laughs> you know 50 years later they had, you know, six children and 19 grandchildren or something like that. There are all kinds of stories like that. Well, now, when, was, when does that happen under normal times? Another thing, we uh, touched last time on the question of, in effect, in a way, you could call it the question of free will. You could. The question here is not free will against you know, predetermination. 
in the way that, say, St. Saint, Saint Augustine would discuss the question. But free will, as opposed to sort of the, the determination that all the pressure of history represents on people. And we spoke about Robespierre in that regard, or <coughs> spoke about others in the National Convention who supported him or opposed him um, on the question of the execution of the king. You know, are, <coughs> do people remain free or do they become, in effect, um, the agents of historical forces that are just beyond them? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a huge topic, is it not? That's a huge topic. In terms of the philosophy of history, it comes to the question when you talk about agents in history, what kind of agency is it? <coughs> People used to say, um, if Lenin had not existed, history would have had to invent him or something like that. If Castro had not, if Thomas <coughs> Jefferson had not, if Peter the Great had not, or whatever. And um, that's, the, that's the kind of, um, issue that I am getting at, um, does, does history create a, an imperative that is so strong that the individual is powerless to resist it? The individual must carry out that imperative, and if the individual falters, then you know, someone will just step in to take his or her place. Or do people retain freedom, and do we have to factor choice and decision into this every step of the way? That's the question for historians. Now, we look at a remarkable time. Seven days in July of, ni of I was going to say 1914. It gives you the idea that I've given this talk before. <laughs> 1789, this isn't the course on the First World War, is it? 1789, all right? Do you see that as a time of, it's an extraordinary time. Is it, a, is it a time when we can in some way test the hypothesis that people remain free or people carry out Im historical imperatives that forces act through them? I mean, I think that there are cases in which scenarios arise to where it's easier for someone to go down one path than it is another. Okay. So like if we were talking about oh, Rose two paths diverged in a yellow wood. <laughs> go on. I mean if we were talking about Robespierre, it's easy to see, at least in my mind, like how he became so power hungry because Yeah. I mean he can, he can credit himself, I mean, along with others. Well, the, the question is not really, do we have adequate explanations of events? I mean, Robespierre became power hungry because of, because of a situation that he was in, but also because of, I think, inner, you know, psychological yeah. traits. Yeah. The, the question is, does Robespierre then at some point just lose control over, over his own ability to decide and choose? I don't, I don't think so. Um. The fact that I mean, one could look at it this way, the fact that someone does something is not, does not suggest that they are powerless not to have done it, right? I mean, if I bang on the table, that doesn't mean that I could have not banged on the table, right? I mean, it seems to me I have that degree of, so, so the fact that I, bound, that I banged on the table, or the fact that Robespierre became power hungry, or the fact that he decided in favor of the execution of Louis XVI, that to me does not decide the question. Yes? I think they're somewhat symbiotic. Because Robespierre was a product of the situation. Yeah. But he certainly added his own particular dynamic yeah. to it. Yeah. And, and somebody else may have done a different, you know, if, if somebody else is charismatic and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, as much of a firebrand of a speaker had been in Robespierre's shoes, he would have steered things maybe a different one way or the other depending on who he was. Yeah. But in as much as there was momentum in the situation, yeah, there was going to be somebody there. Mm -hmm. You know, Thinking about Robespierre, you know one of the passages that interested me in Tackett so much? Not the execution of the king, but the execution of those, what were they, 21 Girondins? 
starting with Bliso, when clearly the you know the, the the crowd pressed for it, the the mountain pressed for it, and they arrested Bliso and the Girondins, but it, the evidence suggests that at first they did not exactly know what they were going to do with them, and that it's only then events beyond then that pushed them in a direction that they did not want to go. Though um, th this idea of some kind of you know, built-in vindictiveness in people like Robespierre and you know, Jacobin leaders or mountain leaders like Saint-Just and Carnot, I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that there was a, there was a give, a back and forth, and it ended the way it ended but, but did not have to. Uh, it's interesting. But what about what about this event? The, this July Fourteenth, July Twenty. Did you see people being kind of driven by historical forces? Is that the way you looked at it? I saw them going against the grain almost. All they're right. They're facing this almost impossible <laughs> force yeah. against them, and they decide to go against it anyway. Yeah. I mean, if you'd guess, Brian. But then they use the tradition of the phrase to yeah. kind of, okay, yeah, people will be against us, but we're going against it. So let's switch the traditions around to uh, yeah. support us. Yeah. And you wonder, how did that decision get taken and by whom? Because here, of course, you're dealing not with Napoleon or Robespierre. You're dealing, dealing with a crowd whose names are not given to us. That's a fascinating point. Yeah. within the event, mm -hmm. using the phrase holiday. Yeah. But to me, the, the key <laughs> yeah. thing is when... You mean happenings. <laughs> happenings within the, the guards within the Bastille sympathize with the crowd, or at least yeah. conceded to them. Yeah. I mean, that, that really changed everything. That changed. That changed everything. I mean, if you ever want to read a great account of a revolution, read Trotsky. He's the number two man in the Bolshevik party. And he's, he's, um, he's also an historian. Stalin exiled him, which gave him time to write. <laughs> and he, he wrote a, an extraordinary volume, uh, an extraordinary three-volume history of the Russian Revolution. And I'm thinking here not on the section on you know, the, the final revolution, the October Revolution, when the Bolsheviks took power, in, in which he played a very crucial role in. I'm thinking of the first revolution, the revolution that brought the Tsar down. There were two revolutions in, in succession in, in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, in, in, in Leningrad, sorry, in, in Peter's Petrograd uh, in, um, in, in 1917. And Trotsky is this incredible author, just incredible writer. And the way he, he describes it, you'd think you were reading a film script about the way ordinary people would, ex would um, approach the guards on horseback who began to flinch. And you know they, they, they had their rifles at the ready, but you could see in their faces that they were <coughs> beginning to, um, they, 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 they did not want the role that they'd been cast in. They were beginning to doubt that they could actually carry this off. I mean, I mean Trotsky is just a magnificent writer. And what he gets across there is this idea of freedom. You know, there are great theories of history, theories of history, that present this all in terms of determination. One of the great theories of history is by your and my close friend Karl Marx. He wrote a theory of history. Well, he, I mean, it's complicated. It's more complicated than this. But he wrote a theory of history. I mean, read the Communist Manifesto someday if you have not. The last word in section one of the Communist Manifesto is unvermeidlich, inevitable, <clears throat> by which he means to say that the workers will rise up, cast off the capitalist system, and set communism in its place. You know, rule by rule by the proletariat, uh, a proletarian state that will control industry, and that is inevitable. But Marx really learned this from someone who's actually on the syllabus this semester, and that's the philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who also had a magnificent theory of history. This developed at the beginning of the 19th century. You're going to read a book about Hegel, but I also, as you know, there are, I think, 10, 10 pages or so from his lectures on the philosophy of history 
where he doles out this theory. And he, he has this idea that there is some force that sort of before space and time that he identifies by the term reason. I mean, if, if I think there's no reason to discourage us from thinking this, of this force as akin to the Christian God. And this, 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 this reason um, has, in effect, one limitation, and that is since it is before space and time, it has not manifested itself in space and time, and so it, <coughs> it feels the impulsion to manifest itself in space and time, and so it does so. And it leads um, history through a, that is humanity, its creation. It leads it through a series of stages toward greater and ever greater freedom. And that's the, he calls it die List der Vernunft, the cunning of reason. And by the cunning of reason, individuals may be acting upon individual passions, but not really understanding that they are carrying out the dictates of a rational force that has its objective for the, for the end of history, namely the freedom of humanity. Well, you're going to look at Hegel from a different angle, too, because we're going to talk about his response to uh, the, re the slave revolution in Haiti. Well, that, that's an interesting story in and of itself, but his, his, his reputation as a philosopher is more or less the way I just described it. You see, part of my job description is I'm supposed to confuse you. <laughs> and I'm just trying to carry out the terms of my contract. <laughs> so, so Karl Marx's society of the pro proletariat turns into a, almost a fascist dictatorship. Well, not the, not the way he put on it. <laughs> Not the way he put it. The way he put it was. Um, but in reality, that's where it went. Marx, w well, yes, yeah. <laughs> We're talking about the theory of history, not Stalin. But I mean, Marxists would say that Stalin represented a bastardization of that theory. Uh, yes? But if reason is going along and what you got from it is what you get, how do you explain that? Because you never followed. Well, you could say that there's no merit to the theory. There's no merit to the theory that anything will happen inevitably, much less a communist revolution. And what we've had is, what we always have had, this kind of meandering here, there, and everywhere in history, to which we try to see some significance, but the idea that we can boil it all, all down to the cunning of reason or the dictatorship of the proletariat is just wrong. Okay. Well, you could say that what's inevitable is everything that we try to construct falls <laughs> of every kind. I mean, that's the only the only conclusion that I think can get can get drawn from history. Retrospectively, it's inevitable. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I think you could set that to music. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, for me, the idea of inevitability means nothing anyway, because uh, almost nothing is inevitable. Um, because you can imagine another outcome. Well, that's why I think Robespierre was who he was, but somebody else may have steered it in a slightly different yes. direction. Yes. Yeah, that's altogether true. That's altogether true. I mean, all you have to imagine is, let's say, Robespierre dies and uh, the number two man in the mountain, I think, would have been Saint-Just. And I, I'm not sure that Saint-Just would have brought all this off. So then what? I mean, counterfactuals get on people's nerves after a certain point because they think, well, it's hard enough to explain what did happen. Well, you know, that now we, you need to overlay this with imaginations of what could have happened. But I think once in a while, it's good just to clear your mind about what what history is and what you're up to when you study it. You're, you're talking about forces that interact in a certain way and that produce certain occurrences or, in more general parlance, events. And they did not have to, but it's incumbent upon to you to explain why they did. Um, and you can imagine it going another way just to kind of sharpen your sense of 
what those forces were to begin with. Because those the forces that 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 pushed, let's say, toward the execution of Louis the Sixteenth, they had to assert themselves against other forces that wanted his vindication, or in particular, that wanted a punishment less extreme than, than execution. <coughs> and you have to begin to imagine that those forces had prevailed in order to understand how strong these forces were that, 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 that actually dominated and made the event what it was. And I think that's the reason to indulge in a counterfactual. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Once the old regime was removed and was eliminated, yeah. would you say that a military coup with a personality like Napoleon was inevitable? No. No, I would not. Um, I mean, Napoleon was the most successful of this new generation of revolutionary generals. Um, but... Um, have him die because of, uh, you know, because he drank some bad water in Egypt, and and then what? Is there someone to take his power, his place? I mean, it's it's very much like the question: What if Hitler had died? What if what if Hitler had died? Well, there were number two and number three and number four and number five and so forth in the Third Reich, but would anyone have have been able to consolidate power in the way that the Fuhrer did? I mean, I can, can go through them and, in effect, rule them all out. Is there some reason why these lieutenants were not able to, would not have been able to, you know, create a hold over Nazi Germany? Um, yeah, so, you know, in, in the talk about inevitability then, you know, I remember one of the things that's interested me is in regard to this whole question of the counterfactual. I have no idea who, who has studied what about Nazi Germany. But to, to understand the, the, what, what became called the Nazi seizure of power, you have to understand that Hitler had to be appointed to a position called Chancellor of the Republic by a president named Paul von Hindenburg who was very old. I think he was 84 when he actually, or 83 maybe, when he actually appointed Hitler. Well, all you have to imagine is that an old man dies and is not in the position to do that. And you say, well, when did he die? You say, all right, he died in 1926. And you say, well, who would have taken his place? An entirely different cast of characters that you really cannot imagine, or someone from that cast of characters that you cannot imagine having done what he did. You can't imagine it. Or he died in 1928, and then maybe a different set. And then he died in 1930, and then maybe a different set. But what you can't imagine is that Adolf Hitler or someone who would have done, who would have named Hitler Chancellor of the Republic would have taken over. So you call that, you know, history by the thread of an old man's life. I mean, you know, there are a lot of contingent factors alongside these great, big, huge forces that push people. A lot of contingent factors. That's what makes the whole story so complicated. So, anyway. I need to hand you your new paper topic, right? I've got, the, I mean, it's on Blackboard, but it's, it's coming. And this is when Andrea really springs to life because, as you know, in the ways that she said, she will be available. If you would take one and then pass it. Oh, oh. You just sprung up right there. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. okay. So um, I want to read through this for you. And then uh, you've got these two weeks to work on it. And, of course, Andrea is available in, in the ways that she has said. Not, I'll tell you. Hey, sorry, can't happen today. 
Otherwise, I'll at least try. So. I think your email address is on the syllabus, is it not? I sent an email out to everybody just basically a question. It is. Yeah. But I can't yeah. do it. Okay. So, so again, the assignment. Mm. The assignment is that on the, th the 16th, first draft to professor and writing fellow, okay? And I, I can tell you that we're going to be looking in particular for the clarity of an argument, the clarity of an argument. That's the, and we spoke about this beforehand, good strong thesis statement, paragraphs that hang together under topic sentences. Sometimes, by the way, what, what an argument needs is a, is a well-placed transition. Because you've got an idea here and you've got an idea there, and I sense something of a relationship between them, but I need a bridge, I need a connector to establish what that connection is. Sometimes that's the point to break a paragraph, start a new paragraph with a strong topic sentence that makes clear what that, what that connection is. So that then comes due, and you, you hand in, yeah, you hand in a copy to me and hand in a copy to Andrea, okay? Um, so let me read this. <clears throat> the writing assignment this time refers to the upcoming reading mic report. The Napoleonic War, War is a very short introduction. Again, I look for a three to four page essay, double spaced. <coughs> this time you turn in two copies of the initial draft, one to me, one to Andrea on 316. Report in his very short introduction covers a good deal of ground. To begin with, his title could be enlarged to include the French Revolutionary Wars. Moreover, numerous aspects of war appear in his perspective, from the rivalry of the great powers of Europe to specific war aims to the experience of warfare on the part of soldiers and civilians alike, and a good deal more. The question. From 1792 to 1815, the French waged war almost without pause. Considering Europe as a whole and or referring to European aims and interests overseas, identify two fundamental ways in which warfare changed or led to change and one fundamental way in which conditions that had existed before the revolution persisted through this span of time. The essay should be in the standard form, an introduction that leads into the topic and includes a thesis statement, a body of the paper consisting of a series of paper, paragraphs, each developing one aspect of your thesis and beginning with, strong, uh, with a strong topic sentence, a conclusion whose role is to restate, not in the same words, the thesis, the arguments of your paper. Use the book for evidence, references to relevant, ele references to relevant events, quotations. Remember that while you need evidence to offer it at great length is to reduce the space you have to develop your analysis, right? I mean, the, the quotation that stretches like that is just too long because you need space to say what all this means. Report is enough. This assignment does not conceal a secret aim to have you write a research paper. Okay? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to go to the library for this. Everything you need is in the book by report. It's a short book. You will not have trouble getting through it. You know the battery's off in this thing. Oh well. Um, I never want to discourage a student from doing more work. And if you want to go to the library, go to the library and read whatever you want. But um, I think sometimes when people make things too difficult in a short span of time, you've got two weeks on this paper, for goodness sake. And if you're going to try to read 10 books to become really expert in this subject, then I think you might just, you know, tie yourself up in knots. So it's all in report. That's all I expect. Questions? Questions? Concerns? Can you do this? I'm going to have to read the book. Oh, it's constant, yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all I heard was a rustling. <laughs> we'll say, take that as a yes. <laughs> OK. Well. I hope people off campus could hear some of this because we, well, they could hear you.